Chapters 26, 27, and 28 of John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 26 Having burned my ship, I plunged into writing. I am afraid I always was an extremist. Early and late I was at it, writing, typing, studying grammar, studying, writing in all the forms of writing, and studying the writers who succeeded in order to find out how they succeeded. I managed on five hours sleep in the twenty-four, and came pretty close to working the nineteen waking hours left to me. My light burned till two and three in the morning, which led a good neighbor woman into a bit of sentimental Sherlock Holmes deduction. Never seeing me in the daytime, she concluded that I was a gambler, and that the light in my window was placed there by my mother to guide her erring son home. The trouble with the beginner at the writing game is the long dry spells, when there is never an editor's check and everything pawnable is pawned. I wore my summer suit pretty well through that winter, and the following summer experienced the longest, driest spell of all, in the period when salaried men are gone on vacation and manuscripts lie in editorial offices until vacation is over. My difficulty was that I had no one to advise me. I didn't know a soul who had written or who had ever tried to write. I didn't even know one reporter. Also, to succeed at the writing game, I found I had to unlearn about everything the teachers and professors of literature of the high school and university had taught me. I was very indignant about this at the time, though now I can understand it. They did not know the trick of successful writing in the years 1895 and 1896. They knew all about Snowbound and Sartore Sartis, but the American editors of 1899 did not want such truck. They wanted the 1899 truck, and offered to pay so well for it that the teachers and professors of literature would have quit their jobs could they have supplied it. I struggled on, stood off the butcher and the grocer, pawned my watch and bicycle and my father's Macintosh, and I worked. I really did work, and went on short commons of sleep. Critics have complained about the swift education one of my characters, Martin Eden, achieved. In three years from a sailor with a common school education, I made a successful writer of him. The critics say this is impossible. Yet I was Martin Eden. At the end of three working years, two of which were spent in high school and the university, and one spent at writing, and all three in studying immensely and intensely, I was publishing stories in magazines such as the Atlantic Monthly, was correcting proofs of my first book, issued by Houghton Mifflin Company, was selling sociological articles to Cosmopolitan and McClure's, had declined an associate editorship proffered me by telegraph from New York City, and was getting ready to marry. Now the foregoing means work, especially the last year of it, when I was learning my trade as a writer. And in that year, running short on sleep and taking my brain to its limit, I neither drank nor cared to drink. So far as I was concerned, alcohol did not exist. 
I did suffer from brain fag on occasion, but alcohol never suggested itself as an ameliorative. Heavens! Editorial acceptances and checks were all the ameliorative's I needed. A thin envelope from an editor in the morning's mail was more stimulating than half a dozen cocktails. And if a check of decent amount came out of the envelope, such incident in itself was a whole drunk. Furthermore, at that time in my life I did not know what a cocktail was. I remember, when my first book was published, several Alaskans who were members of the Bohemian Club entertained me one evening at the club in San Francisco. We sat in most wonderful leather chairs, and drinks were ordered. Never had I heard such an ordering of liqueurs and of highballs of particular brands of scotch. I didn't know what a liqueur or a highball was, and I didn't know that scotch meant whiskey. I knew only poor men's drinks, the drinks of the frontier and of sailor town, cheap beer and cheaper whiskey that was just called whiskey and nothing else. I was embarrassed to make a choice, and the steward nearly collapsed when I ordered claret as an after-dinner drink. Chapter 27 As I succeeded with my writing, my standard of living rose and my horizon broadened. I confined myself to writing and typing a thousand words a day, including Sundays and holidays. And I still studied hard, but not so hard as formerly. I allowed myself five and one hours of actual sleep. I added this half hour because I was compelled. Financial success permitted me more time for exercise. I rode my wheel more, chiefly because it was permanently out of pawn, and I boxed and fenced, walked on my hands, jumped high and broad, put the shot and tossed the caber, and went swimming. And I learned that more sleep is required for physical exercise than for mental exercise. There were tired nights bodily when I slept six hours, and on occasion of very severe exercise I actually slept seven hours. But such sleep orgies were not frequent. There was so much to learn, so much to be done, that I felt wicked when I slept seven hours. And I blessed the man who invented alarm clocks. And still no desire to drink. I possessed too many fine faiths, was living at too keen a pitch. I was a socialist, intent on saving the world, and alcohol could not give me the fervors that were mine from my ideas and ideals. My voice, on account of my successful writing, had added weight, or so I thought. At any rate, my reputation as a writer drew me audiences that my reputation as a speaker never could have drawn. I was invited before clubs and organizations of all sorts to deliver my message. I fought the good fight, and went on studying and writing, and was very busy. Up to this time I had had a very restricted circle of friends, but now I began to go about. I was invited out, especially to dinner, and I made many friends and acquaintances whose economic lives were easier than mine had been, and many of them drank. In their own houses they drank and offered me drink. They were not drunkards, any of them. They just drank temperately, and I drank temperately with them as an act of comradeship and accepted hospitality. I did not care for it, neither wanted it, nor did not want it, and so small was the impression made by it that I do not remember my first cocktail nor my first scotch highball. Well, I had a house. When one is asked into other houses, he naturally asks others into his house. 
behold the rising standard of living. Having been given drink in other houses, I could expect nothing else of myself than to give drink in my own house. So I laid in a supply of beer and whiskey and table claret. Never since that has my house not been well equipped. And still, through all this period, I did not care in the slightest for John Barleycorn. I drank when others drank and with them as a social act. And I had so little choice in the matter that I drank whatever they drank. If they elected whiskey, then whiskey it was for me. If they drank root beer or sarsaparilla, I drank root beer or sarsaparilla with them. And when there were no friends in the house, why, I didn't drink anything. Whiskey decanters were always in the room where I wrote, and for months and years I never knew what it was when by myself to take a drink. When out at dinner, I noticed the kindly genial glow of the preliminary cocktail. It seemed a very fitting and gracious thing. Yet so little did I stand in need of it, with my own high intensity and vitality, that I never thought it worth while to have a cocktail before my own meal when I ate alone. On the other hand, I well remember a very brilliant man, somewhat older than I, who occasionally visited me. He liked whiskey, and I recall sitting whole afternoons in my den, drinking steadily with him, drink for drink, until he was mildly lighted up, and I was slightly aware that I had drunk some whiskey. Now why did I do this? I don't know, save that the old schooling held, the training of the old days and nights glass in hand with men, the drinking ways of drink and drinkers. Besides, I no longer feared John Barleycorn. Mine was that most dangerous stage when a man believes himself John Barleycorn's master. I had proved it to my satisfaction in the long years of work and study. I could drink when I wanted, refrain when I wanted, drink without getting drunk, and to cap everything, I was thoroughly conscious that I had no liking for the stuff. During this period I drank precisely for the same reason I had drunk with Scotty and the Harpooner and with the Oyster Pirates, because it was an act that men performed with whom I wanted to behave as a man. These brilliant ones, these adventurers of the mind, drank. Very well. There was no reason I should not drink with them, I who knew so confidently that I had nothing to fear from John Barleycorn. And the foregoing was my attitude of mind for years. Occasionally I got well jingled, but such occasions were rare. It interfered with my work, and I permitted nothing to interfere with my work. I remember when spending several months in the East End of London, during which time I wrote a book, and adventured much amongst the worst of the slum classes, that I got drunk several times, and was mightily wroth with myself because it interfered with my writing. Yet these very times were because I was out on the adventure path where John Barleycorn is always to be found. Then, too, with the certitude of long training and unholy intimacy, there were occasions when I engaged in drinking hours with men. Of course, this was on the adventure path in various parts of the world, and it was a matter of pride. It is a queer man pride that leads one to drink with men in order to show as strong a head as they. But this queer man pride is not theory, it is fact. For instance, a wild band of young revolutionists 
invited me as the guest of honor to a beer bust. It is the only technical beer bust I ever attended. I did not know the true inwardness of the affair when I accepted. I imagined that the talk would be wild and high, that some of them might drink more than they might, and that I would drink discreetly. But it seemed these beer busts were a diversion of these high-spirited young fellows, whereby they whiled away the tedium of existence by making fools of their betters. As I learned afterward, they had got their previous guest of honor, a brilliant young radical, unskilled in drinking, quite pipped. When I found myself with them, and the situation dawned on me, uprose my queer man pride. I'd show them, the young rascals. I'd show them who was husky and chesty, who had the vitality and the constitution, the stomach and the head, who could make most of a swine of himself and show at least. These unlicked cubs who thought they could outdrink me. You see, it was an endurance test, and no man likes to give another best. Faugh! It was steam beer. I had learned more expensive brews. Not for years had I drunk steam beer, but when I had, I had drunk with men, and I guessed I could show these youngsters some ability in beer-guzzling. And the drinking began, and I had to drink with the best of them. Some of them might lag, but the guest of honor was not permitted to lag and all my austere nights of midnight oil, all the books I had read, all the wisdom I had gathered, went glimmering before the ape and tiger in me that crawled up from the abysm of my heredity, atavistic, competitive, and brutal, lustful with strength and desire to outswine the swine and when the session broke up i was still on my feet and i walked erect unswaying which was more than can be said of some of my hosts i recall one of them in indignant tears on the street corner weeping as he pointed out my sober condition little he dreamed the iron clutch born of old training with which i held to my consciousness in my swimming brain kept control of my muscles and my qualms kept my voice unbroken and easy and my thoughts consecutive and logical yes and mixed up with it all i was privily a grin they hadn't made a fool of me in that drinking bout and I was proud of myself for the achievement. Darn it, I am still proud, so strangely is man compounded. But I didn't write my thousand words next morning. I was sick, poisoned. It was a day of wretchedness. In the afternoon, I had to give a public speech. I gave it, and I am confident it was as bad as I felt. Some of my hosts were there in the front rows to mark any signs on me of the night before. I don't know what signs they marked, but I marked signs on them and took consolation in the knowledge that they were just as sick as I. Never again, I swore, and I have never been inveigled into another beer bust. For that matter, that was my last drinking bout of any sort. Oh, I have drunk ever since, but with more wisdom, more discretion, and never in a competitive spirit. It is thus that the seasoned drinker grows seasoned. To show that at this period in my life drinking was wholly a matter of companionship, I remember crossing the Atlantic in the old Teutonic. It chanced at the start 
that I chummed with an English cable operator and a younger member of a Spanish shipping firm. Now the only thing they drank was horse's neck, a long, soft, cool drink with an apple peel or an orange peel floating in it. And for that whole voyage I drank horse's necks with my two companions. On the other hand, had they drunk whiskey, I should have drunk whiskey with them. From this it must not be concluded that I was merely weak. I didn't care. I had no morality in the matter. I was strong with youth and unafraid, and alcohol was an utterly negligible question as far as I was concerned. Chapter 28 not yet was I ready to tuck my arms in John Barleycorn's. The older I got, the greater my success, the more money I earned, the wider was the command of the world that became mine, and the more prominently did John Barleycorn bulk in my life. And still I maintained no more than a nodding acquaintance with him. I drank for the sake of sociability, and when alone I did not drink. Sometimes I got jingled, but I considered such jingles the mild price I paid for sociability. To show how unripe I was for John Barleycorn, when, at this time, I descended into my slough of despond, I never dreamed of turning to John Barleycorn for a helping hand. I had life troubles and heart troubles which are neither here nor there in this narrative, but combined with them were intellectual troubles which are indeed germane. Mine was no uncommon experience. I had read too much positive science and lived too much positive life. In the eagerness of youth I had made the ancient mistake of pursuing truth too relentlessly. I had torn her veils from her, and the sight was too terrible for me to stand. In brief, I lost my fine faiths in pretty well everything except humanity, and the humanity I retained faith in was a very stark humanity indeed. This long sickness of pessimism is too well known to most of us to be detailed here. Let it suffice to state that I had it very bad. I meditated suicide coolly, as a Greek philosopher might. My regret was that there were too many dependent directly upon me for food and shelter for me to quit living. But that was sheer morality. What really saved me was the one remaining illusion, the people. The things I had fought for and burned my midnight oil for had failed me. Success, I despised it. Recognition, it was dead ashes. Society, men and women above the ruck and muck of the waterfront and the forecastle, I was appalled by their unlovely mental mediocrity. Love of woman, it was like all the rest. Money, I could sleep in only one bed at a time, and of what worth was an income of a hundred porterhouses a day when I could eat only one? Art? culture? In the face of the iron facts of biology, such things were ridiculous. The exponents of such things only the more ridiculous. From the foregoing it can be seen how very sick I was. I was born a fighter. The things I had fought for had proved not worth the fight. Remained the people. My fight was finished, yet something was left still to fight for, the people. 
But while I was discovering this one last tie to bind me to life, in my extremity, in the depths of despond, walking in the valley of the shadow, my ears were deaf to John Barleycorn. Never the remotest whisper arose in my consciousness that John Barleycorn was the anodyne, that he could lie me along to live. One way only was uppermost in my thought, my revolver, the crashing eternal darkness of a bullet. There was plenty of whiskey in the house for my guests, I never touched it. I grew afraid of my revolver, afraid during the period in which the radiant, flashing vision of the people was forming in my mind and will. So obsessed was I with the desire to die that I feared I might commit the act in my sleep, and I was compelled to give my revolver away to others who were to lose it for me where my subconscious hand might not find it. But the people saved me. By the people was I handcuffed to life. There was still one fight left in me, and here was the thing for which to fight. I threw all precaution to the winds, threw myself with fiercer zeal into the fight for socialism, laughed at the editors and publishers who warned me and who were the sources of my hundred porterhouses a day, and was brutally careless of whose feelings I hurt and of how savagely I hurt them. As the well-balanced radicals charged at the time, my efforts were so strenuous, so unsafe and unsane, so ultra-revolutionary that I retarded the socialist development in the United States by five years. In passing, I wish to remark at this late date that it is my fond belief that I accelerated the socialist development in the United States by at least five minutes. It was the people, and no thanks to John Barleycorn, who pulled me through my long sickness. And when I was convalescent came the love of woman to complete the cure and lull my pessimism asleep for many a long day until John Barleycorn again awoke it. But in the meantime I pursued truth less relentlessly refraining from tearing her last veils aside even when i clutched them in my hand i no longer cared to look upon truth naked i refused to permit myself to see a second time what i had once seen and the memory of what i had that time seen i resolutely blotted from my mind and i was very happy life went well with me I took delight in little things. The big things I declined to take too seriously. I still read the books, but not with the old eagerness. I still read the books today, but never again shall I read them with that old glory of youthful passion when I hacked to the call from over and beyond that whispered me on to win to the mystery at the back of life and behind the stars. The point of this chapter is that, in the long sickness that at some time comes to most of us, I came through without any appeal for aid to John Barleycorn. Love, socialism, the people healthy figments of man's mind were the things that cured and saved me. If ever a man was not a born alcoholic, I believe that I am that man. And yet, well, let the succeeding chapters tell their tale, for in them will be shown how I paid for my previous quarter of a century of contact with ever-accessible John Barleycorn.
End of chapter 28、N、thirty of John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty nine. After my long sickness, my drinking continued to be convivial. I drank when others drank, and I was with them. But imperceptibly, my need for alcohol took form and began to grow. It was not a body need. I boxed, swam, sailed, rode horses, lived in the open and errantly healthful life, and passed life insurance examinations. With flying colors, in its inception. Now that I look back upon it, this need for alcohol was a mental need, a nerve need, a good spirits need. How can I explain? It was something like this: physiologically, from the standpoint of palate and stomach, alcohol was, as it had always been, repulsive. It tasted no better than beer did when I was five, than bitter claret did when I was seven. When I was alone, writing or studying, I had no need for it. But I was growing old or wise or both or senile as an alternative. When I was in company, I was less pleased, less excited with the things said and done. Erstwhile. Worthwhile fun and stunts seemed no longer worthwhile, and it was a torment to listen to the insipidities and stupidities of women, to the pompous, arrogant sayings of the little half-baked men. It is the penalty one pays for reading the books too much, or for being oneself a fool. In my case, it does not matter which was my trouble. The trouble itself was the fact; the condition of the fact was mine. For me, the life and light and sparkle of human intercourse were dwindling. I had climbed too high among the stars, or maybe I had slept too hard. Yet I was not hysterical, nor in any way overwrought. My pulse was normal. My heart was an amazement of excellence to the insurance doctors. My lungs threw the said doctors into ecstasies. I wrote a thousand words every day. I was punctiliously exact in dealing with all the affairs of life that fell to my lot. I exercised in joy and gladness. I slept at night like a babe, but. Well, as soon as I got out in the company of others, I was driven to melancholy and spiritual tears. I could neither laugh with nor at the solemn utterances of men I esteemed ponderous asses, nor could I laugh nor engage in my old-time lightsome persiflage with the silly superficial chatterings of women. Who, underneath all their silliness and softness, were as primitive, direct, and deadly in their pursuit of biological destiny as the monkeys women were before they shed their furry coats and replaced them with the furs of other animals. And I was not pessimistic. I swear I was not pessimistic. I was merely bored. I had seen the same show too often, listened too often to the same songs and the same jokes. I knew too much about the box office receipts. I knew the cogs of the machinery behind the scenes so well that the posing on the stage and the laughter and the song 
could not drown the creaking of the wheels behind. It doesn't pay to go behind the scenes and see the angel-voiced tenor beat his wife. Well, I'd been behind, and I was paying for it. Or else I was a fool. It is immaterial which was my situation. The situation is what counts, and the situation was that social intercourse for me was getting painful and difficult. On the other hand, it must be stated that on rare occasions, on very rare occasions, I did meet rare souls, or fools like me, with whom I could spend magnificent hours among the stars or in the paradise of fools. I was married to a rare soul, or a fool, who never bored me and who was always a source of new and unending surprise and delight. But I could not spend all my hours solely in her company, nor would it have been fair nor wise to compel her to spend all her hours in my company. Besides, I had written a string of successful books and society demands some portion of the recreative hours of a fellow that writes books. And any normal man, of himself and his needs, demands some hours of his fellow men. And now we begin to come to it. How to face the social intercourse game with the glamour gone. John Barleycorn the ever-patient one had waited a quarter of a century and more for me to reach my hand out in need of him. His thousand tricks had failed, thanks to my constitution and good luck, but he had more tricks in his bag. A cocktail or two, or several, I found, cheered me up for the foolishness of foolish people a cocktail or several before dinner enabled me to laugh wholeheartedly at things which had long since ceased being laughable the cocktail was a prod a spur a kick to my jaded mind and bored spirits it recrudesced the laughter and the song and put a lilt into my own imagination so that I could laugh and sing and say foolish things with the liveliest of them, or platitudes with verve and intensity to the satisfaction of the pompous, mediocre ones who knew no other way to talk. A poor companion without a cocktail, I became a very good companion with one. I achieved a false exhilaration, drugged myself to merriment, and the thing began so imperceptibly that I, old intimate of John Barleycorn, never dreamed whither it was leading me. I was beginning to call for music and wine. Soon I should be calling for madder music and more wine. It was at this time I became aware of waiting with expectancy for the pre-dinner cocktail. I wanted it, and I was conscious that I wanted it. I remember, while war corresponding in the Far East, of being irresistibly attracted to a certain home. Besides accepting all invitations to dinner, I made a point of dropping in almost every afternoon. Now, the hostess was a charming woman, but it was not for her sake that I was under her roof so frequently. It happened that she made by far the finest cocktail procurable in that large city where drink-mixing on the part of the foreign population was indeed an art. Up at the club, down at the hotels and in other private houses no such cocktails were created her cocktails were subtle they were masterpieces they were the least repulsive to the palate and carried the most kick and yet i desired her cocktails 
only for sociability's sake, to key myself to sociable moods. When I rode away from that city, across hundreds of miles of rice fields and mountains, and through months of campaigning, and on with the victorious Japanese into Manchuria, I did not drink. Several bottles of whiskey were always to be found on the backs of my pack horses. Yet I never broached a bottle for myself, never took a drink by myself, and never knew a desire to take such a drink. Oh, if a white man came into my camp, I opened a bottle, and we drank together according to the way of men just as he would open a bottle and drink with me if I came into his camp. I carried that whiskey for social purposes, and I so charged it up to my expense account to the newspaper for which I worked. Only in retrospect can I mark the almost imperceptible growth of my desire. There were little hints then that I did not take, little straws in the wind that I did not see, little incidents the gravity of which I did not realize. For instance, for some years it had been my practice each winter to cruise for six or eight weeks on San Francisco Bay. My stout sloop yacht, the Spray, had a comfortable cabin and a coal stove. A Korean boy did the cooking, and I usually took a friend or so along to share the joys of the cruise. Also, I took my machine along and did my thousand words a day. On the particular trip I have in mind, Cloudsley and Toddy came along. This was Toddy's first trip. On previous trips, Cloudsley had elected to drink beer, so I had kept the yacht supplied with beer and had drunk beer with him. But on this cruise, the situation was different. Toddy was so nicknamed because of his diabolical cleverness in concocting toddies. So I brought whiskey along, a couple of gallons. Alas, Many another gallon I bought, for Cloudsley and I got into the habit of drinking a certain hot toddy that actually tasted delicious going down and that carried the most exhilarating kick imaginable. I liked those toddies. I grew to look forward to the making of them. We drank them regularly, one before breakfast, one before dinner, one before supper, and a final one when we went to bed. We never got drunk, but I will say that four times a day we were very genial. And when, in the middle of the cruise, Toddy was called back to San Francisco on business, Cloudsley and I saw to it that the Korean boy mixed toddies regularly for us according to formula. But that was only on the boat. Back on the land, in my house, I took no breakfast eye-opener, no bed-going nightcap, and I haven't drunk hot toddies since, and that was many a year ago. But the point is... I liked those toddies. The geniality of which they were provocative was marvelous. They were eloquent proselytites for John Barleycorn in their own small insidious way. They were tickles of the something destined to grow into daily and deadly desire. And I didn't know, never dreamed, I, who had lived with John Barleycorn for so many years, and laughed at all his unavailing attempts to win me. Chapter 30 Part of the process of recovering from my long sickness 
was to find delight in little things, in things unconnected with books and problems, in play, in games of tag in the swimming pool, in flying kites, in fooling with horses, in working out mechanical puzzles. As a result, I grew tired of the city. On the ranch, in the valley of the moon, I found my paradise. I gave up living in cities. All the cities held for me were music, the theater, and Turkish baths. And all went well with me. I worked hard, played hard, and was very happy. I read more fiction and less fact. I did not study a tithe as much as I had studied in the past. I still took an interest in the fundamental problems of existence, but it was a very cautious interest, for I had burned my fingers that time I clutched at the veils of truth and wrestled them from her. There was a bit of lie in this attitude of mine, a bit of hypocrisy, but the lie and the hypocrisy were those of a man desiring to live. I deliberately blinded myself to what I took to be the savage interpretation of biological fact. After all, I was merely forswearing a bad habit, foregoing a bad frame of mind. And I repeat, I was very happy. And, I add, that in all my days, measuring them with cold, considerative judgment, this was, far and away beyond all other periods, the happiest period of my life. But the time was at hand, rhymeless and reasonless, so far as I can see, when I was to begin to pay for my score of years of dallying with John Barleycorn. Occasionally, guests journeyed to the ranch, and remained a few days. Some did not drink. But to those who did drink, the absence of all alcohol on the ranch was a hardship. I could not violate my sense of hospitality by compelling them to endure this hardship. I ordered in a stock for my guests. I was never interested enough in cocktails to know how they were made. So I got a barkeeper in Oakland to make them in bulk and ship them to me. When I had no guests, I didn't drink. But I began to notice, when I finished my morning's work, that I was glad if there was a guest, for then I could drink a cocktail with him. Now I was so clean of alcohol that even a single cocktail was provocative of pitch. A single cocktail would glow the mind and tickle a laugh for the few minutes prior to sitting down to table and starting the delightful process of eating. On the other hand, such was the strength of my stomach, of my alcoholic resistance, that the single cocktail was only the glimmer of a glow, the faintest tickle of a laugh. One day, a friend frankly and shamelessly suggested a second cocktail. I drank the second with him. The glow was appreciably longer and warmer, the laughter deeper and more resonant. One does not forget such experiences. Sometime I almost think that it was because I was so very happy that I started on my real drinking. I remember one day Charmian and I took a long ride over the mountains on our horses. The servants had been dismissed for the day, and we returned late at night to a jolly, chafing dish supper oh it was good to be alive that night while the supper was preparing the two of us alone in the kitchen i personally was at the top of life 
such things as the books and ultimate truth did not exist my body was gloriously healthy and healthily tired from the long ride it had been a splendid day the night was splendid i was with the woman who was my mate picnicking in gleeful abandon i had no troubles the bills were all paid and a surplus of money was rolling in on me the future ever widened before me and right there in the kitchen delicious things bubbled in the chafing dish our laughter bubbled and my stomach was keen with a most delicious edge of appetite i felt so good that somehow somewhere in me arose an insatiable greed to feel better i was so happy that i wanted to pitch my happiness even higher and i knew the way ten thousand contacts with john barleycorn had taught me several times i wandered out of the kitchen to the cocktail bottle and each time i left it diminished by one man's size cocktail the result was splendid i wasn't jingled i wasn't lighted up but i was warmed i glowed my happiness was pyramided munificent as life was to me i added to that munificence it was a great hour one of my greatest but i paid for it long afterwards as you will see one does not forget such experiences and in human stupidity cannot be brought to realize that there is no immutable law which decrees that same things shall produce same results for they don't else would the thousandth pipe of opium be provocative of similar delights to the first else would one cocktail instead of several produce an equivalent glow after a year of cocktails one day just before i ate midday dinner after my morning's writing was done when i had no guest i took a cocktail by myself thereafter when there were no guests i took this daily pre-dinner cocktail and right there john barleycorn had me i was beginning to drink regularly i was beginning to drink alone and i was beginning to drink not for hospitality's sake not for the sake of the taste but for the effect of the drink i wanted that daily pre-dinner cocktail and it never crossed my mind that there was any reason i should not have it i paid for it i could pay for a thousand cocktails each day if i wanted and what was a cocktail one cocktail to me who had on so many occasions for so many years had drunk inordinate quantities of stiffer stuff and been unharmed the program of my ranch life was as follows each morning at eight thirty having been reading or correcting proofs in bed since four or five i went to my desk odds and ends of correspondence and notes occupied me till nine and at nine sharp invariably i began my writing by eleven sometimes a few minutes earlier or later my thousand words were finished another half hour at cleaning up my desk and my day's work was done so that eleven thirty i got into a hammock under the trees with my mail-bag and the morning newspaper 
at twelve thirty i ate dinner and in the afternoon i swam and rowed one morning at eleven thirty before i got into the hammock i took a cocktail i repeated this on subsequent mornings of course taking another cocktail just before i ate at twelve thirty soon i found myself seated at my desk in the midst of my thousand words looking forward to that eleven thirty cocktail at last now i was thoroughly conscious that i desired alcohol but what of it i wasn't afraid of john barleycorn i had associated with him too long i was wise in the matter of drink i was discreet never again would i drink to excess i knew the dangers and the pitfalls of john barleycorn the various ways by which he had tried to kill me in the past but all that was past long past never again would i drink myself to stupefaction never again would i get drunk all i wanted and all i would take was just enough to glow and warm me to kick geniality alive in me and put laughter in my throat and stir the maggots of imagination slightly in my brain oh i was thoroughly master of myself and of john barleycorn end of chapter thirty and thirty two of john barleycorn or alcoholic memoirs by jack london this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter thirty one but the same stimulus to the human organism will not continue to produce the same response by and by i discovered there was no kick at all in one cocktail one cocktail left me dead there was no glow no laughter tickle two or three cocktails were required to produce the original effect of one and i wanted that effect i drank my first cocktail at eleven thirty when i took the morning's mail into the hammock and i drank my second cocktail an hour later just before i ate i got into the habit of crawling out of the hammock ten minutes earlier so as to find time and decency for two more cocktails ere i ate this became schedule three cocktails in the hour that intervened between my desk and dinner and these are two of the deadliest drinking habits regular drinking and solitary drinking i was always willing to drink when any one was around i drank by myself when no one was around then i made another step when i had for a guest a man of limited drinking caliber i took two drinks to his one one drink with him the other drink without him and of which he did not know i stole that other drink and worse than that i began the habit of drinking alone when there was a guest a man a comrade with whom i could have drunk but john barleycorn furnished the extenuation it was a wrong thing to trip a guest up with excess of hospitality and get him drunk if i persuaded him with his limited caliber into drinking up with me i'd surely get him drunk 
What could I do but steal that every second drink, or else deny myself the kick equivalent to what he got out of half the number? Please remember, as I recite this development of my drinking, that I am no fool, no weakling. As the world measures such things, I am a success. I dare to say a success more conspicuous than the success of the average successful man, and a success that required a pretty fair amount of brains and willpower. My body is a strong body. It has survived where weaklings died like flies. And yet these things which I am relating happened to my body and to me. I am a fact. My drinking is a fact. My drinking is a thing that has happened, and is not theory nor speculation. And as I see it, it but lays the emphasis on the power of John Barleycorn. A savagery that we still permit to exist, a deadly institution that lingers from the mad old brutal days, and that takes its heavy toll of youth and strength, and high spirit, and of very much of all of the best we breed. To return, after a boisterous afternoon in the swimming pool, followed by a glorious ride on horseback over the mountains or up or down the valley of the moon, I found myself so keyed and splendid that I desired to be more highly keyed, to feel more splendid. I knew the way. A cocktail before supper was not the way. Two or three, at the very least, was what was needed. I took them. Why not? It was living. I had always dearly loved to live. This also became part of the daily schedule. Then, too, I was perpetually finding excuses for extra cocktails. It might be the assembling of a particularly jolly crowd, a touch of anger against my architect, or against a thieving stone mason working on my barn, the death of my favorite horse in a barbed wire fence, or news of good fortune in the morning mail from my dealings with editors and publishers. It was immaterial what the excuse might be, once the desire had germinated in me, the thing was, I wanted alcohol. At last, after a score and more of years of dallying and of not wanting, now I wanted it. And my strength was my weakness. I required two, three, or four drinks to get an effect commensurate with the effect the average man got out of one drink. One rule I observed. I never took a drink until my day's work of writing a thousand words was done. And, when done, the cocktails reared a wall of inhibition in my brain between the day's work done and the rest of the day of fun to come. My work ceased from my consciousness. No thought of it flickered in my brain till next morning at nine o'clock when I sat at my desk and began my next thousand words. This was a desirable condition of mind to achieve. I conserved my energy by means of this alcoholic inhibition. John Barleycorn was not so black as he was painted. He did a fellow many a good turn, and this was one of them. And I turned out work that was healthful and wholesome and sincere. It was never pessimistic. The way of life I had learned in my long sickness. I knew the illusions were right, and I exalted the illusions. Oh, 
I still turn out the same sort of work, stuff that is clean, alive, optimistic, and that makes toward life. And I am always assured by the critics of my superabundant and abounding vitality, and of how thoroughly I am deluded by these very illusions I exploit. And while on this digression, let me repeat the question I have repeated to myself ten thousand times. Why did I drink? What need was there for it? I was happy. Was it because I was too happy? I was strong. Was it because I was too strong? Did I possess too much vitality? I don't know why I drank. I cannot answer, though I can voice the suspicion that ever grows in me. I had been in too familiar contact with John Barleycorn through too many years. A left-handed man, by long practice, can become a right-handed man. Had I, a non-alcoholic, by long practice, become an alcoholic? I was so happy. I had won through my long sickness to the satisfying love of woman. I earned more money with less endeavor. I glowed with health. I slept like a babe. I continued to write successful books and in sociological controversy I saw my opponents confuted with the facts of the times that daily reared new buttresses to my intellectual position. From day's end to day's end I never knew sorrow, disappointment, nor regret. I was happy all the time. Life was one unending song. I begrudged the very hours of blessed sleep because by that much was I robbed of the joy that would have been mine had I remained awake. And yet I drank. And John Barleycorn, all unguessed by me, was setting the stage for a sickness all his own. The more I drank, the more I was required to drink to get an equivalent effect. When I left the Valley of the Moon and went to the city and dined out, a cocktail served at table was a wan and worthless thing. There was no pre-dinner kick in it. On my way to dinner, I was compelled to accumulate the kick two cocktails, three, and if I met some fellows, four or five, or six, it didn't matter within several. Once I was in a rush. I had no time decently to accumulate the several drinks. A brilliant idea came to me. I told the barkeeper to mix me a double cocktail. Thereafter, Whenever I was in a hurry, I ordered double cocktails. It saved time. One result of this regular heavy drinking was to jade me. My mind grew so accustomed to spring and liven by artificial means that without artificial means it refused to spring and liven. Alcohol became more and more imperative in order to meet people, in order to become sociably fit. I had to get the kick and the hit of the stuff, the crawl of the maggots, the genial brain glow, the laughter tickle, the touch of devilishness and sting, the smile over the face of things, ere I could join my fellows and make one with them. Another result was that John Barleycorn was beginning to trip me up. 
he was thrusting my long sickness back upon me inveigling me into again pursuing truth and snatching her veils away from her tricking me into looking reality stark in the face but this came on gradually my thoughts were growing harsh again though they grew harsh slowly sometimes warning thoughts crossed my mind where was this steady drinking leading but trust john barleycorn to silence such questions come on and have a drink and i'll tell you all about it is his way and it works for instance the following is a case in point and one which john barleycorn never wearied of reminding me i had suffered an accident which required a ticklish operation one morning a week after i had come off the table i lay on my hospital bed weak and weary the sunburn of my face what little of it could be seen through a scraggly growth of beard had faded to a sickly yellow my doctor stood at my bedside on the verge of departure he glared disapprovingly at the cigarette i was smoking that's what you ought to quit he lectured it will get you in the end look at me i looked he was about my own age broad-shouldered deep-chested eyes sparkling and ruddy-cheeked with health a finer specimen of manhood one would not ask i used to smoke he went on cigars but i gave even them up and look at me the man was arrogant and rightly arrogant with conscious well-being and within a month he was dead it was no accident half a dozen different bugs of long scientific names had attacked and destroyed him the complications were astonishing and painful and for days before he died the screams of agony of that splendid manhood could be heard for a block around he died screaming you see said john barleycorn he took care of himself he even stopped smoking cigars and that's what he got for it pretty rotten eh but the bugs will jump there's no forfending them your magnificent doctor took every precaution yet they got him when the bug jumps you can't tell where it will land it may be you look what he missed will you miss all i can give you only to have a bug jump on you and drag you down there is no equity in life it's all a lottery but i put the lying smile on the face of life and laugh at the facts smile with me and laugh you'll get yours in the end but in the meantime laugh it's a pretty dark world i illuminate it for you it's a rotten world when things can happen such as happened to your doctor there's only one thing to do take another drink and forget it and of course i took another drink for the inhibition that accompanied it i took another drink every time john barleycorn reminded me of what had happened yet i drank rationally intelligently i saw to it that the quality of the stuff was of the best i sought the kick and the inhibition and avoided the penalties of poor quality and of drunkenness it is to be remarked in passing that when a man begins to drink rationally and intelligently that he betrays 
a grave symptom of how far along the road he has travelled but i continued to observe my rule of never taking my first drink of the day until the last word of my thousand words was written on occasion however i took a day's vacation from my writing at such times since it was no violation of my rule i didn't mind how early in the day i took that first drink and persons who have never been through the drinking game wonder how the drinking habit grows chapter thirty two when the snark sailed on her long cruise from san francisco there was nothing to drink on board or rather we were all of us unaware that there was anything to drink nor did we discover it for many a month this sailing with a dry boat was malice aforethought on my part i had played john barleycorn a trick and it showed that i was listening ever so slightly to the faint warnings that were beginning to arise in my consciousness of course i veiled the situation to myself and excused myself to john barleycorn and i was very scientific about it i said that i would drink only while in ports during the dry sea stretches my system would be cleansed of the alcohol that soaked it so that when i reached a port i should be in shape to enjoy john barleycorn more thoroughly his bite would be sharper his kick keener and more delicious we were twenty-seven days on the traverse between san francisco and honolulu after the first day out the thought of a drink never troubled me this i take to show how intrinsically i am not an alcoholic sometimes during the traverse looking ahead and anticipating the delightful lane luncheons and dinners of hawaii i had been there a couple of times before i thought naturally of the drinks that would precede those meals i did not think of those drinks with any yearning with any irk at the length of the voyage i merely thought they would be nice and jolly part of the atmosphere of a proper meal thus once again i proved to my complete satisfaction that i was john barleycorn's master i could drink when i wanted refrain when i wanted therefore i would continue to drink when i wanted some five months were spent in the various islands of the hawaiian group being ashore i drank i even drank a bit more than i had been accustomed to drink in california prior to the voyage the people of hawaii seemed to drink a bit more on the average than the people in more temperate latitudes i do not intend the pun and can awkwardly revise the statement to latitudes more remote from the equator yet hawaii is only subtropical the deeper i got into the tropics the deeper i found men drank the deeper i drank myself from hawaii we sailed for the marquesas the traverse occupied sixty days for sixty days we never raised land a sail nor a steamer smoke but early in those sixty days the cook giving an overhauling to the galley made a find down in the bottom of a deep locker he found a dozen bottles of angelica and muscatel these had come down from the kitchen cellar of the ranch 
along with the home-preserved fruits and jellies. Six months in the galley heat had effected some sort of a change in the thick sweet wine. Branded it, I imagine. I took a taste. Delicious! And thereafter, once each day, at twelve o'clock, after our observations were worked up, and the snark's position charted, I drank half a tumbler of the stuff. It had a rare kick to it. It warmed the cockles of my geniality and put a fairer face on the truly fair face of the sea. Each morning below, sweating out my thousand words, I found myself looking forward to that twelve o'clock event of the day. The trouble was, I had to share the stuff, and the length of the traverse was doubtful. I regretted that there were not more than a dozen bottles, and when they were gone, I even regretted that I had shared any of it. I was thirsty for the alcohol, and eager to arrive in the Marquesas. So it was that I reached the Marquesas the possessor of a real man's size thirst. And in the Marquesas were several white men, a lot of sickly natives, much magnificent scenery, plenty of trade rum, and immense quantity of absinthe, but neither whiskey nor gin. The trade rum scorched the skin off one's mouth. I know, because I tried it. But I had ever been plastic, and I accepted the absinthe. The trouble with the stuff was that I had to take such inordinate quantities in order to feel the slightest effect. From the Marquesas I sailed with sufficient absinthe in ballast to last me to Tahiti, where I outfitted with scotch and American whiskey, and thereafter there were no dry stretches between ports. But please do not misunderstand. There was no drunkenness, as drunkenness is ordinarily understood. No staggering and rolling around, no befuddlement of the senses. The skilled and seasoned drinker, with a strong constitution, never descends to anything like that. He drinks to feel good, to get a pleasant jingle, and no more than that. The things he carefully avoids are the nausea of over-drinking the after-effect of over-drinking, the helplessness and loss of pride of over-drinking. What the skilled and seasoned drinker achieves is a discreet and canny semi-intoxication, and he does it by the twelve-month around without any apparent penalty. There are hundreds of thousands of men of this sort in the United States today, in clubs, hotels, and in their own homes, men who are never drunk and who, though most of them will indignantly deny it, are rarely sober, and all of them fondly believe, as I fondly believed, that they are beating the game. On the sea stretches I was fairly abstemious, but ashore I drank more. I seemed to need more anyway in the tropics. This is a common experience, for the excessive consumption of alcohol in the tropics by white men is a notorious fact. The tropics is no place for white-skinned men. Their skin pigment does not protect them against the excessive white light of the sun. The alternate violet rays and other high-velocity and invisible rays from the upper end of the spectrum rip and tear through their tissues, 
just as the x-ray ripped and tore through the tissues of so many experimenters before they learned the danger. White men in the tropics undergo radical changes of nature. They become savage, merciless. They commit monstrous acts of cruelty that they would never dream of committing in their original temperate climate. They become nervous, irritable, and less moral. And they drink as they never drank before. Drinking is one form of the many forms of degeneration that set in when white men are exposed too long to too much white light. The increase of alcoholic consumption is automatic. The tropics is no place for a long sojourn. They seem doomed to die anyway, and the heavy drinking expedites the progress. They don't reason about it, they just do it. The sun sickness got me, despite the fact that I had been in the tropics only a couple of years. I drank heavily during this time, but right here I wish to forestall misunderstanding. The drinking was not the cause of the sickness, nor of the abandonment of the voyage. I was strong as a bull, and for many months I fought the sun sickness that was ripping and tearing my surface and nervous tissues to pieces. All through the New Hebrides and the Solomons and up among the atolls on the line, during this period under a tropic sun, rotten with malaria and suffering from a few minor afflictions such as biblical leprosy with the silvery skin i did the work of five men to navigate a vessel through the reefs and shoals and passages and unlighted coasts of the coral seas is a man's work in itself i was the only navigator on board there was no one to check me up on the working out of my observations, nor with whom I could advise in the ticklish darkness among uncharted reefs and shoals. And I stood all watches. There was no seaman on board whom I could trust to stand a mate's watch. I was mate as well as captain. Twenty-four hours a day were the watches I stood at sea catching catnaps when i might third i was doctor and let me say right here that the doctor's job in the snark at that time was a man's job all on board suffered from malaria the real tropical malaria that can kill in three months all on board suffered from perforating ulcers and from the maddening itch of ngari ngari a japanese cook went insane from his too numerous inflictions one of my polynesian sailors lay at death's door with black water fever oh yes it was a full man's job and i dosed and doctored and pulled teeth and dragged my patients through mild little things like ptomaine poisoning. Fourth, I was a writer. I sweated out my thousand words a day, every day, except when the shock of fever smote me, or a couple of nasty squalls smote the snark in the morning. Fifth, I was a traveler and a writer eager to see things and to gather material into my notebooks. And sixth, I was master and owner of the craft that was visiting strange places where visitors are rare and where visitors are made much of. So here I had to hold up the social end, entertain on board, be entertained ashore by planters, traders, governors, captains of war vessels, 
kinky-headed cannibal kings and prime ministers sometimes fortunate enough to be clad in cotton shifts of course i drank i drank with my guests and hosts also i drank by myself doing the work of five men i thought entitled me to drink alcohol was good for a man who overworked i noted its effect on my small crew when breaking their backs and hearts at heaving up anchor in forty fathoms they knocked off gasping and trembling at the end of half an hour and had new life put into them by stiff jolts of rum they caught their breaths wiped their mouths and went to it again with a will and when we careened the snark and had to work in the water to our necks between shocks of fever i noted how raw trade rum helped the work along and here again we come to another side of many-sided john barleycorn on the face of it he gives something for nothing where no strength remains he finds new strength the wearied one rises to greater effort for the time being there is an actual accession of strength i remember passing coal on an ocean steamer through eight days of hell during which time we coal passers were kept to the job by being fed with whiskey we toiled half drunk all the time and without the whiskey we could not have passed the coal this strength john barleycorn gives is not fictitious strength it is real strength but it is manufactured out of the sources of strength and it must ultimately be paid for and with interest but what weary human will look so far ahead he takes this apparently miraculous accession of strength at its face value and many an overworked business and professional man as well as a harried common laborer has travelled john barleycorn's death road because of this mistake end of chapter thirty two